There's something about cryptid creatures that seemingly capture all of our attention. Maybe it's the element of the unknown, or maybe the danger that these creatures seemingly present. Welcome back to the swamp my friends and welcome if you're new. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true cryptid encounter horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story you would like to share, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or on reddit at r slash thedarkswamp. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. Be sure to backhand that like button, subscribe if you're new, it helps us grow, and get ready for these creepy and downright strange cryptid encounter horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. Little People's Story by Q. Lichard some years back, I decided to hunt geese in early May of 2008. The weather was great, and the birds were flying. After work, I trekked overland to the tundra passing Pilcher Mountain and over into the lakes and marshes by snow machine. There was very little snow due to the warm weather. After packing snacks, I headed out alone. Upon arrival at my hunting area, I noticed a fellow hunter and decided to build a hunting blind not too far from him. Hours passed, and the wind picked up, which drove the waterfowl to fly higher. Finally, it was nearing 10 p.m., and my hunting buddy decided to head home. On a hunch, I opted to stay and set up a hunting blind on the upper end of the marsh. Before that, I counted about eight or more snow machines passing through. There was a lot of open water and dangerous conditions. After reaching my destination, I set up a hunting spot in a clearing. As the birds began to arrive, I was excited and looking forward to going home with a few fat geese. I saw a small boy in the marsh looking at me. Thinking I saw things, I looked away and looked back. He was motionless. Surprised that he appeared out of nowhere, I greeted him. I asked him many questions, but he did not seem to answer. The boy seemed dizzy, disoriented, and afraid. He wore a hoodie, a thin jacket, and tennis shoes, but he was dry yet the water was all around him. Thinking he was in some sort of trance, I used harsh language to get their attention. All he would say is, I don't know. By then, I was upset thinking whoever brought him may have drowned and he was not telling me anything. Then he stated he was alone and after having him swear the truth, he asked me to take him home. I offered him candy, a soft drink, or food and he refused. I found that odd, a seven to eight year old refusing goodies. Shortly, we headed homeward over the hill and down the valley toward Marshall. Nearing Marshall, he asked that I drop him off at his grandmother's versus his parents, and I even escorted him to her home. When I told the grandmother where I found him, her jaw dropped. She mentioned seeing him several hours before and thanked me. It wasn't until the next day that I learned what had actually happened to the boy. The little folk abducted the boy, lured him away from the village, and tricked him into their custody. He saw thousands of little people speaking in English, Yupik, a language he had never even heard before, and apparently others. There were many tunnels and glowing rocks for lights. After being questioned, they showed him three tunnels. He chose one and exited behind the mountain, alone, back in the human realm, what seemed like a few minutes ago but was about four hours. He told his family he wasn't sure if I was human and was terrified of me. That explains why he was so pale and unwilling to speak or answer my questions. I often wondered if the little people intentionally put him where I found him or if that was just a coincidence. Of all the hunters passing by, no one else saw him. I was baffled for some time. What had happened was a paranormal encounter, something out of the ordinary. The little people, our elders often had told us, had taken this child and released him, and I believed he is lucky. Some taken are usually kept. There are more details about his abduction, but only he knows. The boy is now a grown man and I am grateful I saw and returned him home to his family that evening. The area where I found him is often frequented by giant tundra grizzlies and brown bears. This story ran into the Anchorage Daily News a long time ago as well, and I still can remember all the phone calls from nosy reporters as far away as Germany seeking facts. The little people had beady eyes, were about three feet tall, had pointy ears and noses. Urban Legends Can Turn Out To Be Real by Lucky Cat So, buckle up, because I will take you along on my fall road trip. 
a lot of supernatural stuff went down, but I'll tell you the highlight reel. This recently happened in late fall of 2021, so it's not like I distorted the memory over time. I haven't told many, if any, friends or people about this trip, much less the freaky shenanigans that went on outside my van at night. So for some context, I was living in my van at the time. Many factors contributed to this, and even though I had believed myself to be adequately prepared, I truly wasn't. The areas I had traveled this past fall formed a vague diagonal. It went from New York State to South Dakota, then down to Texas. The furthest south I went to was Austin to visit some friends. Then, I went back up to South Dakota to complete some homework. Then, I went back south again to the Quartzsite, Arizona area. Then, I booked it for eight days from the southwest tip of Arizona to the middle of Vermont to stay with my brother, which I landed there around the 8th of December. The first story I'll tell you is when I was in Ohio, traveling west. I'd gotten a little lost, thanks Google Maps. All I will say about it is that there was definitely something in the corn, and it probably wasn't a bear. It stared at me as I tried to get some rest at a gas station. It never moved. Why couldn't it have been something like a fuel drum or some sort of anchored mailbox? Well, because it was literally within a stone's throw of my car on the other side of the road from a gas station parking lot. It made more sense to be a creepy creature than a male reptile or some sort of fuel barrel. It didn't seemingly threaten me, but I could feel it there, staring at me, and I saw it there hulking in the corn, like it was waiting. It was one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced, so I immediately left that area and camped somewhere else that night. Another time, I pulled off the side of the road to rest, again near corn, somewhere near South Dakota, before I headed down south to Texas. I had a hyper-realistic nightmare, a creature that almost resembled the walking cactuses from the Rango movie came bustling out of the cornfield to loom over me and glare. When I snapped up with a start, I could smell something in my van that almost smelled like, well, have you ever smelled uncut grass? That plant smell, like that dirt smell almost. It was weird and I noped right out. Texas was just dystopian vibes all around. Nothing felt right, I'll leave it at that. On my way north to South Dakota to complete some paperwork, which must have been mid-November, a deer leaped out at me over the waist-high highway divider. My three cats and I were okay, surprisingly, so was my van. Once a kind stranger replaced my radiator, I duct-taped what was left of my bumper with T-Rex tape. I mention this because it's part of the reason I was taking it slow and resting in random spots. I ended up on a long detour road going east before doubling back west and finally north because of construction work on the interstate. That added a few pretty miles to my journey to say the least. I ended up stopping at a rest stop with bathrooms, vending machines, and a little grill and picnic table in Iowa. There were a few big rigs with trailers that looked strange to me, but hey, I didn't care and wanted to take a nap. Well, I tried anyway because what happened next definitely makes me wonder what was hunting the monsters. I was tossing and turning and trying to get some sleep as one does. Reasonably, suddenly, a series of sounds that could only be described as moans, groans, shrieks, and huffing of a dying animal. There was a gross smell. That was what I noticed at first. It smelled like fresh roadkill or maybe hot garbage. Like, have you ever smelled a garbage can that just has that juice in the bottom of it? Mmm, smells like good old freaking decay. Then the sounds came and changed as they grew louder. At first, it sounded like the animal was angry and scared, with long and loud guttural shrieks, longer and louder than even trained opera singers. But as the animal, or whatever it was, got closer, they turned into sad and searching moans, squeals and grunts and huffing like it was sighing in an attempt to breathe deeper, and it walked on two big hooved legs, judging by the sound of the footsteps. It walked around my van out of all the vehicles. It must have heard me shifting around or something. The thing sounded almost like a pig-deer-goat hybrid, the kind of goats that shriek like humans, the type of pigs that breathe into squeal, and the kind of deer that bellow. The sound shook my van, and they were so close. When the noises stopped and the truck across from my tailgate carrying what I can only assume were pigs left, I quietly got out to refill my water bottle and take a bathroom break. I noticed a few spots of fresh blood around my vehicle, and a few even on my car, like whatever it was was leaning over my van. It was creepy. But then I went to Quartzsite, where I unknowingly caught COVID, so that sucked. 
But while I was out there, the locals told me to always check beneath my vehicle, never let my animals out, especially at night, and not to spend time outside alone after dark if I was near the edge of town. Coyotes have been known to frequently hide underneath vehicles or campers, snatch cats, dogs, and ankles, and drag their prey off into the desert. Ouch. Part of my experience with the strain of COVID I caught had very angry and demanding bowels and being too nauseous to do much about it. At one point, I had to get outside and disrobe from the waist down to avoid soiling myself or the only relatively clean clothes I had. Baby wipes did the next best thing to help me with the smell. I felt like I was dying. I tell you this because I had no problems with aggressive wildlife or spooky supernatural happenings in the area until that night. After being sick on the rocky gravel of the desert and defeatedly crawling back into the van and trying to sleep it off, I heard whispering, or what sounded like whispering. It sounded almost like the movies. I smelled ash or soot, like I had just stuck my nose in a cold fire pit. I could almost make out what the whispers were saying and tell it was different voices whispering together. It was all around my van, even near the roof. It wasn't like wind through leaves because there was no leafy trees near my van, no wind in sight. I felt like the spirits were angry at me pooping where I did, but they must have understood that I didn't mean to. There were clicking sounds and dragging sounds like something was gently pawing at the side of my van. Not trying to get in, but more like poking at it out of curiosity. I saw nothing out there. The following day though, I got out of Arizona. About eight days later, I made it to my brother's place in Vermont. They say there's something out in the wilds of America. It's supernatural and gets stronger the further west you go. I don't know what it is, but I do know that it was territorial and will bully you into running away if you're smart. These may have been different spirits, some sort of creature that I've never heard of, skimwalkers, bigfoots, dogmen, who knows. But no matter where you travel, just remember, it's not your home, it's theirs. Lurking in the Everglades by Author Jojo I was always surprised by where my line of work led me. The plans I once had for my life all melted away, carried off in a completely different direction. I thought I would be a lawyer, and I used to think my dad was so cool. Of course, as a child, you're naive and always think the best of people. Getting older, I would see the kind of people my dad would try to get out of trouble with. He was good at his job, way too good, and I, well, I'm getting off topic. I do that pretty often. Back then, when I started my journey into law, I had the intention of only helping the good people, as gray of a line as that is. I tried to make a positive impact, so when I needed additional college credits, I was all in for lending a helping hand. I would take any volunteer position. It did not sound altruistic, but I liked it. There were a lot of middle parts, though. You know how it is. These small choices you make, one step after another. At the time, they may seem insignificant, but when you look back and see the journey for what it is, it sure is wild how far off the path life can take you. A few volunteering sessions for animal shelters led to wildlife rescue, and eventually I found myself here. I was trudging through the Everglades with a small team of trustworthy friends. Strolling, I could see the wakes of water wrapping around my feet. I used to hate having wet socks, but it's something you learn to live with. Despite the rubber boots that ran up to my thighs, somehow water was going to find its way in. It always does. I watched the three men before me as we waded through the swamps. All the things that used to bother me now bring me peace. The humming heat around us, the stench rising from the still and murky water, even the feeling of being isolated from the rest of the world, it became a home of sorts. I started a business handling nuisance alligators after helping a situation where someone's pet had lost its leg to an alligator that wandered too far into a residential area. The little dog was lucky to have only lost a leg. The alligator could have swelled the whole thing, I'm sure. It's of course not strictly a business that I can do full time, but it helps me put some money aside. Now and then we'll get a call to handle some gators that step too close for comfort, or we'll be called in an assistance of an injured alligator. This time though, it was different. I received a call from a group of researchers. They told me they were studying a cluster of alligators in the Everglades. The animals in the area were acting incredibly strange, and they wanted to see if there were any unusual substances in their bodies. 
With alligators high on the food chain, it made sense that if anything digestible was causing the animals to act weird, that it would be found inside of the alligator. So we went out and set a few of our traps down in areas with signs of dwelling. After waiting a day or two, we started walking to check what we might have caught. They wanted us to try and get two, but they would still pay the same rate if we only got one. A rate that I should mention was more than I would typically make all year for gator trapping. We should be coming up on one of them soon, so keep an eye out. Andrew spoke from the front of the pack, just loud enough for us to hear him. He always had a good knack for this, and he'd been a hunter for longer than I remember. We were used to going to his house and shooting BB pellets in the trees with him, so recruiting him for my little side business was a no-brainer. If gators were caught, others would likely come by and check out the situation. The last thing you want to do is come across a curious gator. With each step, it seemed like navigating the swamps was getting harder and harder. I didn't recall the terrain under the water being so very the last time we were out there. Yet it seemed like every step I took had a different elevation. Sometimes I would feel like something sharp was prodding the bottom of my boot. If the boot weren't as sturdy as it was, I'd be feeling whatever it was, as I was stepping on something that could pierce the skin for sure. Looking at the three men in front of me, I could catch them occasionally looking down at their feet. They must have been thinking the same thing that I was. However, we all must have assumed that we remember the last trip going much smoother. I stopped for a moment. Then I noticed a ripple of water out of the corner of my eye. Instead, it was a small wake rushed by us, too small and consistent to be an alligator, or at least an adult one, but worth noting. I eyed the ripple for a moment but never saw anything surface, and it just continued until vanishing out of sight. Standing in place, I waited for it to return, but a distant shout broke my concentration. I must have zoned out or something as the group had already put a sizable distance between us. I have a terrible habit of getting distracted and losing track of time, so you certainly don't want a lawyer doing that, and I know that much. Turning to the shout, I saw Connor bending over with his hands submerged in the murky water below us. Connor and Zachary Jones, brothers that made up the rest of my little squad. I met them at the animal rescue projects that I worked for. They were participating in some traveling shows that handled wild and exotic animals, something of a circus, I believe. Once they became more involved with the performance, they learned how mistreated the animals were. While they were working the animal rescue with me, they were also campaigning against the circus act, eventually getting enough momentum, thanks to social media, to shut the whole thing down. Deep care for animals, the drive to see their lives improved, and the knowledge of how to handle the dangerous ones. It was a no-brainer. Plus, they were quiet, and Andrew and me were also quiet. I only wanted to work with a small group of hard workers I could rely on. We didn't need to be best friends, we just needed to get the job done. That's crazy, I could hear Connor mutter once I had gotten close enough to hear. His brother inquired for further information. Hang on, it's stuck. I could see him struggling to free what I assumed was one of our traps. After a necessary tweak of the arm, he finally pulled the thing free and lifted it from the water with no gator inside. The item was incapable of housing any gator that might wander into it. The metal cage had been completely mangled. We all stared at the cage. Only the chirping bugs filled the air as we all examined the cell. And we were probably all thinking the same thing. Have you ever seen anything like that? Andrew said out loud to no one in particular. It wasn't just destroyed. And the fact that it was utterly submerged was problematic too, you know? How could this happen? It would have had to have been pulled down as the cells are designed to give enough room for the alligators to surface and breathe. Unless one of us had encountered any dinosaurs, I doubt it, Zachary chimed in. A silly statement, but he wasn't wrong. Half of the cage looked pristine and the other half, well, it looked like it was twisted and mangled like something had just straight up taken it and ripped it in half. It didn't look as if something had chomped down on it, but it definitely looked like a massive creature came, took a bite and threw it, you know? It was a clean movement. One bite, if it was a bite that did it. That's insane. And these traps are all pretty new. There's no way. I trailed off, watching the guys prodding away at the cage. It was like we thought the answer would come just by looking at it long enough. The other trap shouldn't be too far off, I continued. This lifted Andrew's head and he started walking through the swamp again. We had attached small lines of high visibility tape to the cages so that they would be easier to locate in the dark water. However, you still need to be pretty close to find them. Andrew ran his hand over the surface of the water, and as he did, I scanned the area where he stood. I took in the sights, trying to remember where we might have set some traps. 
They can, of course, shift in the water, but not by much. I saw a few small black trees sticking up from the depths. They looked like they were long dead, jet black bark wrapped around thin, jagged, broken limbs. It looked as if a giant spider's leg were sticking up from the muck. Is that why the area looked so different? I didn't remember those trees being there when we set the traps. How can dead trees spring up in a few hours, though? Miles, I heard Andrew speak. My name almost sounded excited, like it was punctuating the thoughts in his head. I walked over slowly, still watching for snouts sticking above the water worried some behemoth alligator was lurking around every corner. The soft sloshing of the brothers followed behind me. Andrew's arm was submerged, but unlike Connor, he didn't seem to be trying to pull the cage up. His arm was motionless. Reaching in, I looked down and saw the barely visible orange tape. There was a cage where we stood. There's a gator in there. My eyes dropped. This cage was also completely submerged. So unless the alligator got trapped within the last few hours, it was definitely dead, Andrew chimed, interrupting my thoughts. But it didn't drown. He seemed reluctant to pull the cage out of the water. So I knelt and reached in. My fingers quickly met with the alligator's bumpy surface. Running my fingers, I followed the creature's shape toward where Andrew had his hands. Right about where I was expecting to meet the alligator's front legs, I felt my hand dip further into the water, and there was nothing there. I could feel the ridges of the alligator's body cease to exist in the squishy remnants of what was still left inside of it hanging out. The thing's head, and nearly all of its entire front half, were just gone. Again, like something just took one big bite out of it. The cage was just as void of its finishings as the alligator was. It was annihilated like the last cage. Slight traces of red were swirling in the water by my arm. Nothing was adding up at all. The elevation of the cages had changed. When we set them up, they had more than enough room to let the alligators breathe. Water levels can vary, but there wasn't any rainfall, and it hadn't been that long. The cages, and now an animal inside one, were ripped in half, and the area felt alien. I was beginning to wonder if we were even in the right spot. Had we wandered into an older set of traps that were abandoned? Holy crap, Zachary shouted. We all turned to look at him. He was now at the back of the pack. What's your deal? Connor snapped back, Zachary's shout still bouncing off the trees around us. Where'd they go? Zachary continued. Something like panic was rising in his words, making them worry. I looked around the area trying to see what he was talking about. He didn't seem like he wanted to share, perhaps struggling to find the words. Maybe it took me a moment because they weren't there when we set the traps. Where did what go? I'm sure Andrew was frustrated by the sudden intrusion and lack of clear communication, something a hunter wouldn't be too fond of. The trees, I answered for Zachary, but he turned back to look at me as if to confirm that was the object of his ire. There was an unmistakable fear in his eyes, a conclusion he drew that we hadn't quite caught up to yet. No, I'm... I'm out, I'm sorry. Before we could protest, Zach turned away and started walking back. Though he seemed confused in the panic, he wasn't walking back the way he came. Instead, whether it was on purpose or not, he was walking toward where the trees were. Come on, man, relax, Connor spoke, starting to follow him hurriedly to catch up with him. However, Zack kept walking until one of his steps made his body sink, and that made him stop. The water around the rest of us was almost to our waist, but when Zack dropped, the water rested just below his shoulders. As I had known them, the Everglades and the swamp's elevations hardly changed so drastically. Certainly, not in just one step. It was like a sheer drop. We were frozen admittedly watching Zack like he was a lab rat. He too stood there frozen. Curiosity must have taken a hold of him as I saw his body shifting. I couldn't tell exactly what he was doing, though his arms and legs were... Was he investigating what was happening? It's squishy, he said, looking up at all of us. I saw his shoulder pivot, and I could tell he was placing his hand in front of him. There was a long silence. He was in disbelief. It's breathing... Then as the words came out of his mouth, we saw his body drop again before we could process those words that he had just spoke before he even had an opportunity to take another breath. This time his head plunged into the water. Spouts of water rose as his fingers filed against the surface, and then he was gone. Connor yelled his brother's name and moved toward the drop-off as fast as he could. Despite our best efforts, we couldn't talk sense into them, and there was no way I'd reach him in time. Connor reached out his arm and Zack managed to get one of his arms above the surface again, his fingers moving erratically, grasping for anything. 
Finally, reaching further down, Connor grabbed his brother's arm. As their skin met, I saw one of those trees, though at that moment I knew they were no trees. The thin, dark structure shut up and pierced through Connor's arm. It seemed like it came out of Zack's hand, like his brother was puppeted as a lure. He tried to pull his arm away. A choppy scream barely manifested, but the dark spindle through his arm quickly curled, hooking the limbs so it wouldn't get loose. He was standing still at that moment, watching the horror displayed in front of me, seeing the red from Connor's arm coating the black, whatever it was. I was now in some sort of sense of adrenaline, the spiking fight or flight response, but my senses were overloaded, like I was overclocked and I could feel it. I just couldn't move though. None of us had before because we were moving or racking our brains around what we saw, but I felt it, my body ever so slightly rising and falling, the water drifting up and down against my rubber boots, but maybe an inch or two. It's breathing. My thoughts manifested audibly. I turned back to Andrew and almost blacking out the atrocity a few feet away. We're on top of it, I growled. Everything was becoming so dense around me. I felt like the air I was trying to pull into my lungs were made of lead. I couldn't remember how long we had been at that elevation or how long we were walking without dropping into the water further. Andrew was already taking action. I imagine his panic response had to be made of sterner stuff. That stark realization pushed Connor out of my mind entirely, just for a moment. Turning around, I could see him still tugging away, trying to become free from the black spire that had hooked him. The limb, I think, seemed to wriggle with Connor like it was fighting back to make sure it wouldn't lose him. A fish on a line, trying desperately to get free, a shred of hope cast by the shadow of something so unfathomably significant. Andrew and I knew not a word needed to be spoken, but I knew that Connor was a goner. If anything, he had become another tool for the monster lurking under us. Live bait is always more effective. Sure enough, our thoughts manifested, and Connor began to lose strength, his body succumbing to blood loss. He started slimming down until his frame smacked against the water's tension. Before gravity could pull his body under, we witnessed at least two dozen of those dark spikes dart up and puncture his body. I could see the water around Connor's head bubble as his screams were stifled. The spikes all bent just as they had before, and it looked as if Connor was the one who had sprouted spider legs. They all retracted just enough to begin pulling Connor under the water, and there was nothing we could do. Maybe if I had acted faster, or I don't know. I didn't stop to see him join his brother either way. I didn't realize how significant the thing I was standing on top of was, but I needed to move. If we just went back the way we came, it didn't attack us on our way in. Maybe pulling that broken cage loose is what had woken it. Maybe those uneven bars were stuck in its skin, and it perceived the pain of them being pulled out as a threat. There wasn't much time to ponder the mechanics of the thing or even to wonder what the thing was. Andrew was close behind me. I think the thing we were standing on was starting to move. It was like walking on a giant turnstile. I had to keep readjusting my path, keeping an eye on the distant and more reliable trees. I could see out of the corner of my eye the spider legs lifting from the water and I think searching for us. Or was that how it moved? It's hard to run in water like that. With the gear we had on, it was like the water was a thick sludge killing any momentum we could get. My legs started to burn quickly but I had the innate fear that the thing we were on was turning around. After seeing what happened to the cages and even the alligator, I had no intention of letting that thing get to face us. We could just have stayed on top of it, away from the spires, but then what? It would have been hell trying to get any rescue, especially considering how little we knew about the creature. I saw that small ripple again just ahead of me. I didn't know much, but I was hoping my hunch was correct that it was a tail. With how slow that thing turned around, we could have outran it if we just got off of it. Indeed, it couldn't navigate the areas with denser tree coverage. Where we set the traps was a fairly wide open area. Eventually, I felt my legs dipping further into the water. We were reaching the end of it. I could feel my feet sinking into the swamp floor as I fell far enough in. The soft sense of soil felt like a beacon of light. My god, we made it. Just then I heard Andrew yelling behind me. Just then I heard Andrew yelling behind me. My heart sank and caught him, I thought. Turning around though, he was wrestling with his leg. A trap! My leg! It's trapped! With a racing heart, I rushed back to him. I could feel the water moving like when you ran in a circle with your buddies in the pool. Just the thing running around was making the water swirl. We didn't have much time. Reaching down, I could feel this trap had also been mangled. Though it was more squished than chewed, the frame was bent and sticking straight up. 
allowing Andrew's leg to glide through when he stepped down. I pulled at his leg as he screamed from the pain. Unfortunately, the bars had broken in a way that they had speared through his leg and gave us no wiggle room. I tried pulling the bars, but they wouldn't budge and I could hardly get a good grip. Behind Andrew, I could see the spider legs getting closer and closer to us. The thing's face, presuming it had one, was going to be on us soon. Go, Andrew whispered. What? Shut up! Just help me! I snapped back, but Andrew had stopped struggling already. I could free him if we had the time, and knew how much time we had. But I couldn't see the trap, and it felt like I was met with too much resistance in every way. Not to mention the red that was drifting to the surface from the puncture wounds. With the cage and blood loss, there was no way we would be able to outrun it. Don't look back. Not at this, Andrew said, trying to sound cool through the winces of pain. Or maybe just he had accepted it. I wish I had gotten to know him better. It doesn't matter how close you are with someone when they, you know, you'll always feel like you could have been closer. I kept fighting until I felt his hands press my chest and push me back. I nearly tumbled into the water. You come back and kill this thing. I took a step back, the spires of darkness poking out of the water closing in on us with each passing second. Don't watch, he said again as he pivoted his back to face behind him. As per request, I turned and started wading through the water. Each step makes my leg burn more than the last. I could feel the hot, swampy air filling my lungs as my breathing got more desperate. Behind me, I could still hear Andrew occasionally telling me, Don't look back! Each time he said it, the words got heavier and more panicked. The final time I heard those words, it was a long, drawn-out yell. Whatever it was, I knew the thing was bearing down on him. And then, I heard nothing. The Everglades returned to a familiar silence. All I could do was bury it keep walking forward and fight what was brewing inside of me. I saw a small wake running beside me as I left the Everglades. Turning to face it, I saw the familiar mossy green face of an alligator passing by, its nose and eyes above the surface. It didn't pay me any attention as I watched it swim through the shallow waters away from civilization. I got back home a few hours later, sat in my room for a good long time. I thought about how I would approach anyone about this, especially the families of the men I lost out there. I stared for a long time at the pictures of the Everglades trying to find spots similar to the one I had set traps in. I wondered how the monster would ever move from where we found it. Did it? Or was it like coral, just sitting around and waiting for food to come to it? Could it be killed? Should it be killed? Was it part of the natural ecosystem? I knew so little about it, I had hundreds of variations pop through my head of what it could be and what it would look like. I'm always surprised by where my line of work led me. The plans I once had for my life all melted away, carried off in a completely different direction. I thought I would spend my life trying to help animals and make places safer for people. Now I'm shopping for guns, I'm writing details on a whiteboard like a maniac, and I'm assembling another close group of people, the kind of people my dad would have tried to keep off the stand. All to handle a new type of pest. It's petty. It might come across with natural order, but I don't care. I can't sleep without hearing Connor crying for his brother. I can't bathe without feeling like I'm sinking in the water without thinking of Zachary and Andrew. His words echo in my head all the time, every single day. Don't look back. And I won't. I'm moving forward, and just as instructed, I'm going to kill that thing. Thanks for listening to these creepy and downright strange cryptid encounter horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to elbow that like button in the face so it really feels it. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, it really helps us grow. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to send it in at swampdweller.net or at r slash thedarkswamp on reddit. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. I don't know about you guys, but something lurking in the Everglades that you can't quite see and you can't quite defend yourself from sounds absolutely terrifying. I'd love to know in the comments tonight what story was your favorite and why. Let's start a discussion. If you made it all the way to the end, be sure to comment the code word Urban Everglade to let me know you made it to the end and to also confuse people who didn't. I think it's kind of funny. Thank you guys as always for supporting the swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this on a daily basis without you guys. Don't forget to come join me over on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and all those good places. And I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.